going to talk about HTML5 video and uh, sort of look at platform choices and ways to sort of build uh, tools to uh, deal with all the sort of complications that come into delivering uh, video to lots of different um, devices and browsers and with HTML5. Um, I'm Michael Dale. I work with a company called Kaltura. They do an open source uh, video platform. And I do the front end architecture for that platform. So we've heard a lot today about the promises of HTML5 from a lot of different speakers. So I mean, we had this idea of sort of harmonic uh, vendor collaboration with you know, cross vendor sharing and the spec process in which people are working together, uh, this idea of write once and have it work multiple places, sort of this ideal of Java from the late 90s somehow being actualized all of a sudden with multi-vendor participation. We had the idea of uh, performant applications, some, you know, something where HTML5 would be uh, capable of rendering experiences that were comparable to native applications through the extensions, through the CSS animation, uh, properties and through WebGL and then accelerated canvas, et cetera. And we, and we had this idea that this platform would be updated because we're now living in like this network software system, right? Like every, all these devices are connected to the network. Why wouldn't they be running something more recent? Uh, and, and of course, unicorns, rainbows, and uh, kittens. I mean, like it basically wasn't possible and just like unicorns. Not going to happen, unfortunately. What, what do we have in its place? We have uh, inconsistent spec buy-in. Not, not all the vendors can agree. And especially a slow process when any spec uh, runs up against sort of native app uh, functionality and something that uh, if, I mean, if you, if you, especially in the mobile space, I mean, desktop, we have this sort of competition for innovation in the HTML5 browser platform. But when it comes to mobile, uh, we, we start, start, things start getting a little, uh, slower when, it, when the feature uh, directly competes with something that's already supported natively. Um, we have all these middleware solutions that have to come into play, and some of which will, I mean, I'll, I'll look a little bit at the Kaltura solution later in this talk, uh, but also, of course, there's numerous uh, systems that have been built to sort of bridge these gaps, and some of them are quite good. Um, and inconsistent performance, you know, uh, we never really had, um, the, the promise of sort of accelerated web experiences is still just that, a, a promise. And of course, the, the, uh, the network connected devices for some reason are not using that network connectivity for uh, good, not putting it to good use. So we get, you know, these uh, Android 2X devices are still really dominant in the market with something like 25%. We still, and you know, and then not only that, we have sort of this, uh, uh, lack of support for systems that are still out there for some reason. So we have, you know, no, we won't be getting IE 10 for Windows Vista, for example. Um, and, you know, not to mention XP machines, which I won't even try to worry about those. But, you know, there's uh, delays in sort of pushing out updates. Uh, and then so how does that apply to HTML5 video? We have all those issues with the general HTML5 platform, but then on top we have some other, th some other problems like uh, codecs and playback. We don't, we don't just have one codec. We have WebM, H.264. I mean, the situation's uh, getting a little bit better. It looks just last week the Mozilla, one of the principal Mozilla developers posted an update on a few of the tickets, and it looks like Mozilla's going to come around for H.264 support. I mean, especially for mobile because of the hardware accelerated chipsets that are available, but then also, also on desktop, they're going to try to um, just reuse the, the existing um, uh, H.264 support within a given platform. So they're not going to really compromise on their paying for H.264 uh, restriction of, of the fact that it's an open source project and they're giving it away as free software, but it will sort of tie into system level components for decoding H.264. Um, we have display layer inconsistency. So if you start building this nice uh, GUI for your HTML5 player, all of a sudden you realize it doesn't show up on the iPhone because we have a native playback on the iPhone device. We have um, playback invocation restrictions. So for example, autoplay. 
this is something that you know seem on the surface seems not like a big deal. You just uh, you know if you're on iOS, you just have to click before you can play. But it it comes it it gets complicated once you have uh, you know more complicated things like if you want to have a thumbnail and then asynchronously load your your library, all of a sudden you can't you know get that uh, initial speed on the loading the page because it, you now have to invoke the video through a JavaScript uh, asynchronous include, and now you, if you haven't captured that click in a clever way, uh, you're, you, now you have to have the user click again to start the video. So you have to do tricks to work around that. Uh, and then multiple video asset playback. I mean, this is just a natural limitation of some of the mobile hardware just doesn't have uh, support for multiple H.264 decoding pipelines. And so you, you stuck with just a single video on the page, which again, you know, depending on how you design your system, if you're not looking at uh, that issue, you could think of some neat solution to, you know, inject an ad uh, in a separate video tag and then pull it out, uh, and then it would look really nice on your desktop uh, Chrome experience. And then when you bring it down to your iPad or iPhone or Android device for that matter, all of a sudden things start breaking down. <clears throat> so what are we going to do to get these kittens out there? Got to build some scaffolding and roll them along. We we have to know the platform limitations, as as I was discussing earlier. We have to sort of take a look at what um, what you know what classify the different browsers so that we have a way to uh, decide. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, so sort of say, you know, these, these, so these group of browsers can have these sort of features, these groups of browsers and devices can have these sort of features, have a way to sort of communicate to client. I mean, because a lot of this is not, it's not that, like, I don't know it. It's that, you know, your, your client that wants, you know, a certain experience comes to you and say, says, how come it's not auto-playing on iOS? Or how come it's not, you know, how come I can't, how come users can skip my ad on iPhone? Or whatever it is. You know, like, th there's... Uh, uh, it's important to communicate the limitations of the platform to whoever you're providing the services to so that you don't get caught in hot water, I guess. Or, I mean, just, just let people know what's going on. Like, a lot of people just don't know. So it's important to let people know. Uh, and there's some good resources for sort of uh, figuring out all these different platform limitations. I mean, this Stack Overflow, Google, of course, is a great way to just uh, find out what's going on. And then there's a few publications that people have written and the Can I Use website, of course. I mean, I'm, these resources have been referenced quite a few times throughout the conference. I'm sure you guys have seen them before. So now that we know our, um, our uh, limitations of the platform, we've got to look at our goals for delivering these video experiences. And we have to sort of think about, uh, so approaching this problem from in terms of what we were trying to do from an OVP perspective is, or online video platform perspective is we need to you know look at are we going to have one player or many players you know how are we going to configure these things um, are we going to embed into a controlled context or an unpredictable and if you caught the talk before he was sort of outlining all these sort of iframe issues and how how can we sort of leverage that to sort of uh, contain our player um, skinning once or skinning lots of times you know like what type of skinning framework are you going to propose you have to sort of find the right balance between things that uh, are already set and things that can be configured. You don't want to lean too, too much one way or too much the other way, um, especially if you have to map it out to Flash as well. So uh, if you want to support IE8, for example. Um, and then there's platform trade-offs. Like, like on iOS, you can, you can do a full screen request, but now uh, you no longer have DOM overlays. So what does that mean? Either you do sort of a pseudo full screen within the space that the platform allows you, or you uh, go out to the native full screen and you get the full player content experience, and then just sort of deciding which one of those you're, you're going to go with, uh, and letting the, the end user sort of configure that, because you know, if, they, if their whole business model is around monetization of content, then they're going to need to not let people skip ads, but if their model is just around promotion, promoting that, a particular video, delivering it however they can, then they'll probably be fine with... Uh, you know, showing the native iOS player. Uh, and then again, thinking about whether we're supporting mobile or just supporting desktop. So well, there's different features in desktop that you can take advantage and we'll get into each of these bullet points in a second in more detail. And then supporting uh, plugins or sort of um, dynamic configuration. Again, that's uh, sort of 
when you have like a large set of features to choose from, uh, coming up with a delivery strategy that still enables it to come uh, arrive to the client quickly, but not uh, pre-establish what uh, plugins any given client's going to enable, sort of like a, a resource loading system. And of course, you know the basic rules of any software project. You want it to be fast, robust, and maintainable. So like I mentioned, the, for an online video platform, flexibility is really key. So a lot of those questions are going to be, yes, we want everything. And, and then we end up with not just a player, but a player platform. So something that uh, can be invoked in lots of different ways and can be, you know, if, if they want to deliver a video to a BlackBerry, we're just going to, you know, an old BlackBerry, we're just going to send a image tag with a link to the video asset. You know, we're not going to render out the entire player, but then some uh, system to pick and choose between all those different uh, issues is what we sort of build. Um, and part of that is sort of like this architecture for on page plugins versus in, in player plugins, and we sort of map that out like we have a way to configure something so that it works within a player context and then also uh, as an on page context, and we'll get into that a little bit more detail. That, that basically means the idea with the uh, player platform, I'm sorry, the player platform is that you're not only able to configure the player itself, but also sort of on-page services around that player. So that may be like a playlist or any of these other things. And then, but, but we unify the configuration through this sort of single K-widget concept. And I think that pr proves to be useful in terms of delivering rich widget features. And I think some other talks have uh, referred to this as well, sort of trying to figure out the best way to um, deliver, you know, it, again, and you're delivering scripts to some other, somebody else's page. So it's, it's always tricky to uh, write your code in such a way that uh, it doesn't get m messed up with <laughs> when, people, when, client, when client pages do crazy things. Um, and we can look at some example, we can look at that real quick if uh, we want to. This is, for example, I just want to quickly highlight the difference between a on-page playlist and a playlist widget, so, and we support both, right? Like, so if you want to uh, have sort of like a self-contained iframe, that, that's this. This whole thing is inside an iframe. Uh, if it's Flash, it's just rendering the whole Flash Swift with the, uh, the different playlist items are rendered in, in Flash versus a on-page playlist where the content is uh, added to the page and then the client can style it with CSS on their page. And so this, this piece of the page is not uh, in the iframe, it's actually living on the client's page and then they can, you know, play with it and do all their JavaScript tweaks to it that they need to do uh, without sort of uh, crossing that sort of sandboxed player or sand sandboxed widget, you know. And, but if they, if they need the whole playlist to be sandboxed, then that's what the other, that's what the other one was. Yeah, and again, to, so if you're approaching this problem from, uh, it, it's, a, it's sort of a generalized problem really. You, when, when you're approaching this, providing software services to web page embedding contexts, you have to sort of decide where you're gonna draw your lines of abstraction and what's gonna be safe and what's not gonna be safe. I mean, to that point, I mean, you wanna keep your code in a sandbox. And, uh, and that's basically what we do with sort of an iframe embed. For the, for the player itself. And just to get a little bit into the technical details of how that works, we, we use something called, I mean, I mean, you all know what it is, I assume, uh, friendly iframes, which are iframes that are built out on the page itself. So it's not, it's not a cross-domain request for an iframe, it's an iframe that uh, through JavaScript is injected into the page. And there's a few, quite a, well, a few reasons for doing this. Um, you, we avoid uh, asynchronous issues. So post message is an asynchronous call. Uh, if, if you're dealing with sort of real-time video applications and like you want to say you set the current time of the video player to some new time, then uh, if, if it was an asynchronous call, then all of a sudden if you tried to read that property in line, it would not have been updated yet. So you'd have to set up a complicated proxy to uh, bridge that gap, which we did initially, but now we've moved away from that and we have friendly iframes so you're able to directly access all the properties on the, the player itself. Uh, in, without any of those asynchronous post message issues. Um, also, post message gets kind of slow on some of the other, so post message goes all the way back to like IE8, uh, it, and if you were sort of wrapping a, 
uh, delivery mechanism that included Flash or something for one of the older IEs, you could, it could, things could get slow. Um, and, and we also want to look at, uh, well, anyway, so that's basically summarizes the iframe situation. We, we, support, we support the player being invoked through a cross-domain iframe as well, but then we don't have the JavaScript API. And it's an important distinction to think about, like, if you're, gonna, if you're going to have to set up your own JavaScript code on the client page anyway for, to handle the post-message interactions, you might as well do a friendly iframe and have total control. There's no point in uh, trying to have an API on both sides of, the, of your iframe when uh, you could just have a friendly iframe and have much more uh, flexibility and control over the player itself and accessing its properties and stuff. Uh, another, another thing we run into is the thumbnail embed, which we referred to earlier. Sometimes like on a blog or um, on a website with lots of videos, we could have, uh, it's very quick to render players if they're just an image and a link, <laughs> but it's, it takes very long to render them if they're, uh, if it's a full iframe player and everything. And the idea here, again, is to uh, simplify the way people have to do that. If, if they were to do it themselves, they would, you know, they would put their little link on, their, on the page and then it wouldn't work because on, I, on iOS, like we discussed earlier, uh, they would press play and then they would inject the player. And then if without the user click on that new DOM, they wouldn't be able to play the content. So what we do is we uh, have a black video source and we issue a play on the you know, and then wrap the asynchronous response around it, and then switch the source on the black video tag. So you have to do sort of little tricks to, to make usable uh, experiences, I guess is the point there. <clears throat> and then when it comes to skinning, uh, again, we want to retain flexibility, so we, we have a few different skinning models. Uh, it depends what your type of project is or what you want to accomplish, but. Uh, some, you know, for some things, I mean, I know a lot of people here would probably promote uh, pure CSS based skinning uh, just because you, you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of theme, theming the player or if you want to, you know, engage, put the player into a different context, you can have a little more flexibility if, you know, if it's just a CSS file and then you can just manipulate it pretty easily. Uh, if it's, uh, but not everybody's like a CSS ninja, so sometimes we just have to let people throw some sprites on the page and just map them out. And some, and some folks uh, integrate that way as well. But the important part is that it, the, the configuration layer makes it easy to map it, map out whatever, you know, if you map it out to a particular CSS file, you still have the sandboxed player within the iframe, so you're not, you know, you don't risk your site CSS screwing with the player, but if you want to be able to load your site CSS into the player, I don't know if you have some overlays or whatever, the configuration mechanism in, in supports invoking local CSS through relative paths where necessary. Um, getting back to the platform trade-offs, again, we were just, as we mentioned earlier, you sort of have to enable clients to make those decisions themselves because you don't want to pre-decide how things work, right? Like, so if, uh, you know, different clients have different use cases and different needs, so you just have to uh, let them issue those trade-offs. And there's, a lot, there's actually quite a few of them if you, you know, start dealing with all these different platforms and things, I mean, uh, for example, there's a proprietary, or no, I don't know about proprietary, but uh, there's an actual there's an actual attribute that you can add to the video tag to opt into Apple AirPlay, like for playing. So if you watch a video on your uh, iPad or your iPhone and you want to play it on your Apple TV, they, you have to add a little attribute to your to your video tag to support that, and little things like that. And sometimes you want to turn it off, sometimes you want to turn it on depending on your content. Android, of course, the big, there's, there's kind of like this gap in the Android uh, platform right now where Adobe said, you know, we're cutting off Flash and Google said, we're gonna ship Chrome, but they didn't quite line up. So now you have uh, the, the stock Android browser shipping on all the Android 4 devices, which, you know, is fine for, I mean, they, and Android, you know, they did a good work on improving the browser from what it was, but Android 4 stock browser is not mobile Chrome by any means, uh, when, especially when it comes to media and all the things that you need to be able to do there. So um, we're kind of in like this little limbo land right now, but I think eventually Chrome will uh, propagate the Android ecosystem and things will be less painful. 
Um, but again, letting, letting users sort of, if they build out sort of a HTML5 experience or they don't want to uh, support Flash, they can have options for making that happen. And many more. I mean, I could, I could pull up the page if you want to see. There was, well, if the internet was working, I could pull up the page. There it goes. I mean, there's just lots of different configuration options that uh, people need to be able to do. Okay, and then how do we make it all fast? So again, we, we have like a lot of plugins available. This is just because uh, the nature of sort of an online video platform, as you start sort of supporting uh, all these different providers, so like for ads, there's six, four or five providers. For um, analytics, there's another four or five providers. And then for player features, there's all these different player features. And you know, so altogether, the library becomes massive. You know, like uh, I guess the payload would be for a full featured player would be something like two megs or something, you know, really big because there's all these different plugins and features that get developed independently. But, uh, and then, but then we need to be able to deliver that to the client very quickly. And what we do is we use a, a resource loader that dynamically packages them per player. So uh, you still get the as few requests as possible while um, retaining flexibility for arbitrary plugin combinations. And likewise, for the, we, we exploit the fact that we're uh, using this iframe to, to, again, package in anything we're going to need uh, in that single iframe request so that at the end of the day, you get like very few requests as possible. And uh, you can see the source here. I mean, this is just our iframe. You can see like we, ha we have all the, the player metadata, all the player layout configuration, all the plugins that it's going to use. All that information is sort of packaged into uh, a single payload with the iframe so that you're able to maximize the speed in which the player's uh, delivered to the client. And we sort of favor within, the, within our system, I mean, it, I guess you have to measure the trade-offs uh, for whatever uh, system or widgets you're delivering, but we lean towards uh, fewer requests over cache miss, which just means that uh, we don't like round trips and, and we, and of course you have to make some trade-offs in terms of saying, uh, you know, maybe this, maybe we could group these resources and give them a long expire and then maybe the client, when they visit the player again, they would already have that resource versus if some, they visit some arbitrary other player. But at the end of the day, we, we lean more towards uh, a single request just because, uh, I mean, the entire payload ends up being, you know, less than a second of the video playback. It's, it's more important to avoid those round trips because if you're going to be watching video online anyway, you probably have enough bandwidth to, to stream it, the video in real time. So you at least, uh, knowing that, you can uh, lean towards uh, fewer round trips because you know round trips take a certain amount of time. So you can factor that in. Um, and then, of course, you know, no, no need to go into this detail because that's not what this talks about, but of course you want to run your automated tests and you want to make every feature, every feature is both a demo of the feature, it provides the documentation for configuring the feature, and it provides the automated test for the feature. So you have a unified uh, sort of manifest for every feature that uh, encapsulates its entire life cycle across its use cases that you need to support for maintaining that feature. Um, and that, that's an important aspect of sort of scaling out when you have all these different people working on all these different pieces uh, just to keep things relatively sane. Um, and then taking advantage of desktop HTML5, this wanted to talk a little bit about like how the, you know, the desktop HTML5 experience is sort of racing ahead from relative to the uh, mobile HTML5 experience. And that doesn't mean, um, just a good opportunity to sort of explore like what type of future applications we'll be able to, to support. Um, like the, as I mentioned, like the, as, as mentioned previously in the conference, like the media source API for appending bytes to video player that's, lets you write like an adaptive streaming layer on pure JavaScript. And you know, if you look at it today, if you're sort of rationalizing it today, you say, well, it's, you know, that's only in Chrome. I don't think we can really rationalize spending effort to develop a HLS or a adaptive streaming solution today because it's only in that browser, but you have to sort of look a few months ahead and assume that 
things will make their way out to mobile. Uh, I can show I can show a quick sample of an experiment that I did um, with uh, WebRTC. And again, it's just it's just good to you know explore all these different possibilities as they uh, become uh, more and more accessible. This this was a a, a video wall where it doesn't really work very well if it's a single user, but um, if you open up a new, a new user, oops, sorry, uh, okay, oh, okay, that's interesting. Where'd my other tab go? Okay, well, there. I don't know if it's as well. Let me try. I found that WebRTC stuff's a little tricky to develop for because you're always sort of video chatting with yourself. And that can be tricky, especially with this resolution. Okay, hold on. I think we're going to do it. Be able to show it. This is just a, a video wall that's triggered through. Um, the Internet Archive did this project to uh, allow a bunch of different, um, to index all the news programming. So every, every day they capture like 30 or 40 hours, or maybe more like 100 hours of um, footage. And this is just so that, and, and they index it all with the closed caption feed so that you can sort of search through all the news coverage and what this application does, it just sort of has multiple people watching a particular uh, set of news, and then you're able to sort of, uh, if you're both watching the same thing, which this is no, it's not going to be demoable on this resolution, I think. Um, but anyway, it shows a little, ah, crap, I'm not going to be able, I'll just skip this. But it does, it shows a little video chat of both of you creating sort of a space where uh, if you're both watching the same news coverage, then all of a sudden you have sort of like this video conversation that opens up around the content that you're watching together. Um, it's just kind of a fun experiment to try to think, you know, what kind of applications become possible. And I think it would be worth noting um, that although, so in the, in the beginning, earlier in the days, I remember somebody mentioning that, uh, you know, that these, that WebRTC, you know, like, oh, this has existed in Flash for a long time. You know what's so different about it in HTML5? Uh, I think the main difference is that you can do it in a few lines of JavaScript. You don't need Adobe uh, communication server on the back end. You don't have all these proprietary protocols. You have this open approach, and uh, I think it'll enable some more interesting possibilities. And I guess my, the whole point of this little side section of the talk is to say keep exploring the upcoming features of the HTML5 library, and those are usually going to be happening in, in the desktop space. Uh, to just have a good perspective on what type of features you want to uh, be able to support in the future. Okay, so I think that's about it. Uh, there's the URL for the, the slideshow. A lot of the, there was a lot of links I didn't click click on, but um, yeah. So thank you. <laughs>